So yeah, you should be able to ask questions in the chat or turn your microphone. There are reactions that you can use as well. Um, we do also, um, if you go to the um, schedule link, so you have the, um, the live lecture schedule that has a link and it's also um, in the PowerPoint. I don't think you showed that, Rika, but uh, there's a, a link where you can uh, post feedback after the session, uh, even if you're watching the recording or whether you're attending live. Uh, so you can use that. Um, and I'll post that in the chat. Or actually, if Rika, if you could uh, post that feedback link in the chat so they have that. Um, since, since I have you, might as well uh, give you something to do. Um, but then, uh, yeah, you can visit the live lecture schedule. You should probably have a link to it in your course, um, and it will uh, tell you what's going to be covered in each lecture. It gives you the schedule for this eight weeks of when the lectures are going to be uh, and what topics are going to be covered. So that's definitely a, a good place for you to be aware of to look at. Um, it also includes links to uh, past recordings, but you should also have a module in your uh, in your course um, that has links to past uh, to the live lectures uh, from a previous uh, the past eight weeks. Uh, so there will be three lectures for each module. If you want additional uh, details, we went over uh, more specific homework problems and so on. Um, so that's a resource you have available as well. Um, for tonight, though, we're going to be looking at Module 3. There's a lot in Module 3 uh, you'll find. So um, part of it is just you need to actually take the time to learn the, the content. Some of that might be new to you. <clears throat> if you try and just go and do the homework, um, you're probably going to have a hard time on some of the things. Um, I want to also, before I get into content, remind you, um, you have exam, uh, your midterm exam coming up as well. We'll have some extra sessions for that. So there, there'll be a session coming up this Saturday at two o'clock, then the Monday time, six to seven, and then also a Tuesday afternoon, 1.30 to 2.30. So those will all be reviewing for the midterm exam. Um, as you're doing that, um, I recommend you check out the formula sheet for the course um, as you're starting to think of exam review or even as you're doing homework to be aware of what is on it and what's not. There isn't really anything related to module three uh, on that formula sheet, but there are some things related uh, to module one and two, um, particularly uh, some of those word problems, some of those formulas are on it the quadratic formula is on it. So uh, you know what is on it and what's not on it, then that can help you prepare. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna start working through and I'm actually going to, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna open this up. So, and this is good to be aware of if you're not, um, you can do your homework within Ivy Learn, but if you go to the Ivy Plus bookshelf, launch courseware uh, and, open that um, in my lab of mastering, then you can go to past homework and do it in review mode. You have the study plan. So you have different uh, things. So if you go to your student grade book, you can look at uh, those homework assignments that you've done in the past and review. And so if you missed a homework assignment or want to go back, uh, especially as you're preparing for the midterm exam and the final exam, you can go back to past homework assignment uh, assignments, and then the study plan is also a good resource. Um, but I'm going to look at um, so section three three. I'm going to look at some specific questions, and I'm going to have some just kind of general comments. Section three three. One thing that may be uh, not obvious is you have the even odd, uh, even and odd functions. Um, and those are related to symmetry, but you didn't actually directly learn symmetry. So the types of symmetry that you want to be aware of 
is um, symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So that's where the y-axis is like a mirror and you have, you know, whatever the graph does on one side of the y-axis, it has to match on the other side. Um, so uh, that type of symmetry, that corresponds to an even function. So if you think of like uh, the graph of an x squared type thing, where you have an even power of x, it has that type of symmetry. Then you have symmetry with respect to the origin. So now you want to think of the origin as a center of rotation, where then that graph can rotate halfway around there and match up with itself. So you, if you have a piece over here, you have to have a matching piece, uh, whatever it's doing. Um, so you have kind of that rotational symmetry, and that's going to correspond to an odd function. So that would be like your x cubed graph. So as long as that sort of center of rotation is located on the origin, uh, that would be an odd function. Um, then the other thing from section 3.3 3 is uh, when you're looking at the intervals uh, where something is increasing, decreasing, constant. I think it's fairly intuitive that you can look at the graph and you can recognize is what it's doing. Uh, the main thing to watch for is you're always thinking left to right. So if I have a graph that's doing something like this, I don't want to look at the peak and say it's decreasing, it's decreasing. You want to think left to right and think it's increasing, then it's decreasing, then it's increasing again, then it's decreasing again. But the way you want to tell and identify where it's increasing and decreasing is you don't want to be looking at the ordered pairs and giving the X and Y values. You want to look at the starting point. You want to just look at the X values. So uh, what are the pieces of the X axis corresponding to those pieces of the graph? So you're going to really, uh, I, don't, I don't recommend that you look at it and find where it's increasing, then find it where it's decreasing, then find where it's constant. I recommend you just start um, on the X value, start with the farthest left X value. If there's an arrow, it might even be negative infinity. You start with that piece and you're gonna have just intervals that you know, you're going to have all of the, the x values come up where one ends, the next one begins, and you're covering all of the x values. Um, so I'm going to look at an example uh, of both of these topics. So I'm going to bring up um, module 3a homework. And I am looking at number seven. I'm mainly just going to look at, at part C. Um, so I'm going to zoom in on this graph here. So, so I'm going to think left to right, and I look at the first piece of the graph here, and that's constant. It's a horizontal line. And so again, I'm just looking at the, the piece of the x-axis. Then the next piece we have that graph decreasing. Then we have another little piece where it's constant, and then there's a piece where it's increasing. Now, it doesn't really matter uh, where it's crossing the x-axis or if it gets more or less steep. Uh, so you have some different things happening here, um, but we're just looking at, is it overall uh, flat or going down or going up? So then, uh, looking at these pieces. So I have uh, going from negative three and then the next, uh, the change is at negative one and then it's decreasing, decreasing uh, to positive one. Um, again, not talking about the Y values, but just looking at the X values. Um, so at, at positive one there, then uh, at positive two, it changes, it's increasing again, and then at three. So that's the breakdown of just where on the x-axis that those changes are happening. So the intervals are going to be from negative 3 to negative 1, and from negative 1 to positive 1, and from positive 1 to 2, uh, and from 2 to 3. Now, uh, Math Lab, 
technically these should be intervals with parentheses. Um, I think because that can be confusing because those look like ordered pairs and we don't want you to think of these, think about ordered pairs here. We want you to just think about intervals of X values. Then MATLAB accepts and I recommend that you use square brackets just so you're keeping reminding yourself that these are intervals of a starting X value and an ending X value. The Y values don't go into this at all. Um, so then you would just um, you know, put those into the right pieces. So you would have um, you know, the, the increasing. So that would be this, um, the two, three would go on the increasing. Um, and then the negative one, one would go to decreasing. And then the constant gets the negative three, negative one, and the one, two. And so you see those um, entered here with the square brackets uh, with comma between the two pieces um, where there was more than one. Um, so that's how I recommended thinking through the increasing, decreasing, and constant. Think left to right, break down what the graph is doing, um, and then sort them into the increasing, decreasing, and constant. Um, so then uh, section three, four, um, the main thing you want to take away from that, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, the main thing you want to take away from section three, four is those base functions of, you know, what, what is a quadratic uh, square graph look like in general? What is an absolute value graph, cube graph, square root? Um, so that then when you get to section three, five, and you're doing transformations on those that you know kind of what your starting point is. But that's fairly straightforward. What you might struggle with a little bit in section three, four is the piecewise defined functions. Um, so the tricky parts on the piecewise defined functions, uh, a couple of things is finding the x-intercepts and finding the range. So I'm going to look at homework uh, number 20. And just, again, some parts of this. Uh, but generally, with the piecewise defined function, what happens is you're taking the domain and you're breaking it up into pieces and saying, if you're on this part of the domain, if your x fits this qualification, you're going to use this. Uh, function definition, and then on some other part, it's going to be a different definition. So you have to look at your x value. If you're finding, you know, f of zero, you have to see which part uh, zero fits, um, and so on, no matter whatever you're plugging into the function. Um, for the x-intercepts, so x-intercepts for any function, the general rule is you set the function equal to zero, and solve for x. When it's a piecewise defined function, you have to set each piece equal to zero and solve. So we have four x equals zero, and we have one equals zero. Well, one equals zero is never true. So that one doesn't go anywhere. Four x equals zero is true when x equals zero. Now, is zero an x-intercept of the function? Well, then we have to go back and check. So the second step is check if that x value is in the domain of that piece. So to get 4x to be zero, we need to plug in zero for x. But the 4x is only if x is not equal to 0. So x equals 0 is, is exactly what is not in the domain of the 4x part. So that is not an x-intercept. So in this case, this example has no x-intercepts because the one piece didn't give any, and the other piece, um, what it would have given, was uh, not in the domain of that piece. Um, looking at the graphs then, when you're looking at the range, um, 
So you want to think of for range of kind of collapsing the graph onto the y-axis and looking at the y values that are covered. Um, so the correct graph for this um, was, I think it was this one. Um, so if we look at this, when we do that, we cover everything and it doesn't really matter that there was that point off by itself it just kind of gets merged in with the rest of the graph what's important is that the one value that's skipped where that hole is um but what you could have is something maybe where you have a graph where you have one piece maybe doing something like this and then maybe you have a point down here and then maybe you have something like this where then you know the range would do something like this and so you'd have a piece and then you have maybe just this point where there's just that point by itself that would be where we would have an isolated point um so if you end up with just like a single point on uh, on the range that doesn't have it any part of the graph um surrounding that particular y value but just that y value by itself um so that's where you have the options where you know the range has an isolated value or doesn't have an isolated value or consists exclusively of isolated values um so you might even have um you know you might have a graph that does something like this um So that's a, a type of graph uh, where then the range would just be each of those individual values. So that would be a list of isolated values for the range. Um, but in this example, uh, as far as this problem we're actually looking at, there aren't any isolated values. Um, and that's not something that's really going to come up. Um, I don't think anywhere else in the course. So not something to stress a, a lot about, um, but just if you're confused by that, um, you know, if you're just looking at sections of the y-axis that aren't just single points by themselves, then it doesn't have any isolated values. All right, um, moving on to section three, five. Um, just get uh, I'm trying to just get like some blank space here. Um, all right. Okay, so three five is transformations. So just the basic rules. Um, you want to pay attention to whether something is inside versus outside. So inside would be something like if I have x plus two squared or square root of x minus three or square root of negative x or absolute value of three x, whatever. So something instead of just having an x squared or square root of x or absolute value of x or whatever, we have something else done to the x inside. Uh, versus outside would be like a 3x squared or a negative absolute value of x or a um, absolute value of, or negative square root of x, absolute value of x plus 2, anything that's happening outside of the, um, the action. So the square, the square root, the absolute value, those are the actions that determine the shape of the graph. If you have the square, you have the, you know, that, that would make it be the parabola shape. The square root would make it be that half sideways parabola, et cetera. When you have adding, subtracting of numbers, uh, when you change, you know, have a negative sign, just a negative sign inside or outside, or a multiple of a number, those aren't going to change the overall shape. They are going to move the graph around. They are potentially going to stretch it or compress it, compress it. Um, but if you think of it, it's all things that you could do, like if I just even select a, a piece of what I've drawn here, right, what can I do? I can move it around. I can stretch it, 
sideways or compress it. Um, I can even, um, I don't think I can here, but you, you can often like flip something horizontally or vertically, all those types of things. Those are what the transformations do, but it's still the same base, base shape. Um, so, all right, all of these inside things, inside things are always going to be horizontal changes. Outside things are going to be vertical. Um, so then we have uh, the actual things that happen. So uh, addition and subtraction are what are going to shift and just move the graph. Um, so that would be up, down, left, right. Up is addition outside. Down is subtraction. Left is addition inside. Right is subtraction inside. Now, what you'll sometimes see is, you know, you might have something like f of x minus h and then plus k. So the minus h tells you that basically you're doing the opposite um, so if you if you had to guess, if you're just looking at, you know, addition, you would think that would be right rather than left, probably. Um, so we have that kind of opposite behavior when it's inside. So sometimes that'll be represented by actually making it be a, a minus. Um, and so then the the shift. So um, but think of like if you have um let's say x squared plus two, that would be a shift up. x squared minus five would be down. x plus two squared would be left. x minus two squared would be right. Um, but sometimes you'll see with uh, the generalized form, they'll just do it as a minus on the inside. Um, then, um, Stretches, compressions um, is multiplication. You really only need to worry about vertical. So you shouldn't ever be doing anything with a horizontal stretch or compression, just vertical. Um, unless like if you go onto trig or something, you will do some, um, you'll have to deal with horizontal. But for the types of base functions we have, you really only need to worry about vertical. Uh, a stretch would be if it's making it taller and narrower, a compression would be making it shorter and wider, but math lab doesn't really have you distinguish that. So you just need to know when you have a number out there. So if you have a three X squared or a one half X squared or whatever it is, any number that's out front that's being multiplied uh, by the, the function would be that vertical stretch or compression. And then you have reflections. So a negative would be a reflection. A negative on the inside would be a horizontal reflection. You really only need to worry about that with a square root because any of the other types of functions, a horizontal reflection either isn't going to change it at all or is going to change it in the exact same way as a vertical reflection. So in most cases, you just need to worry about vertical reflections, but with a square root, you could have a horizontal. Um, now, as far as what you'll do with this in math lab uh, or in your homework, on your quizzes, et cetera, there's a couple of things. So one is just being able to use the graphing tool. So for that, I'm going to look at number 37. Um, But I'm, I'm not going to actually do this question. I'm just looking at this, this in order to show you the tool. So you click on the graph. The first thing you need to figure out is, uh, so this tool is only used for um, square and cube functions. So you have to look and figure out, is it a square or a cube? If it's a square, you choose the square tool. If it's a cube, you choose the cube tool. If you hover over it, it'll even tell you which it is. Uh, so let's say you're doing a square then you can just click anywhere on the graph. No matter where you click, it's going to start you out with that basic x squared or the basic x cubed if it's a cube. And it'll pop up this, this toolbox. 
So here's where you're going to tell it the transformations. I recommend though, if you uh, that, that you sketch out what the graph should look like, so that as you're applying these transformations with the tool, that you can tell that it's doing what it's supposed to do. But you want to start with uh, any vertical stretch or compression. You again should not be doing anything with the horizontal stretch or compression, just the vertical. But you're just going to type in uh, whatever the number is. So if there's a number out front. Uh, even on this example, we have, I can see there's a three out front there that's being multiplied. So that would just get typed in here. And you'll see then, you'll see that causing the stretch. So it's vertically taller, but that makes it horizontally narrower. Uh, if there's a flip, so if there is a, a negative number being multiplied out front, then you, you would apply that as a reflection. Um, if there's, you know, whether it's a, Again, whether it's a stretch or a compression, if it's a number smaller than one, then it would make that wider, flatter graph. So you might have that, but that would all go. So any anything where it's just a, a number out front is going to affect the vertical stretch of compression and potentially, again, if it's negative, a reflection over the x-axis. And then you're going to have the vertical shift. So that's what's just with this slider. So that would be, again, anything being added or subtracted outside. You just want to make sure you apply the vertical shift after both doing the vertical stretch or compression. And if there's a reflection over the x-axis, you want to do that reflection before you do the shift. Uh, if I do a shift, let's say it needs to go, it has a plus three. But if I then reflect, now it's turned that into a shift down instead of a shift up. Um, and then the horizontal shift, you want to make sure that you like switch the sign. So if I have like in this example, it's an X minus four, I'm going to do a because that's to the right four. So I'm going to the right four, a positive four on this horizontal shift slider. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much, I mean, this example has, you know, the three out front is going to be the vertical stretch or compression. Um, the one thing this doesn't have is a reflection. Um, so if it was a negative three out front, then I would have the reflection as well. But then we have the vertical shift, the plus two, and then the horizontal shift, the X minus four means a horizontal shift actually of positive four. Uh, so we get this graph. If you're not sure if your graph is right, you can start plugging in numbers. If I plug in four for X, does it come out two? If I plug in five, does it come out five? If I plug in three, does it come out five? And you can start checking whether you have the right um, order pairs showing up on your graph that you should have. Um, but yeah, the other thing to be aware of, if, if you do have a graph that doesn't work out or that is counting wrong, your instructor when they try and go and look at it, all they can see is the actual graph that it, end up, that it ended up graphing. They can't tell anything about what you did to get that graph. So the more information they you can give them about exactly what you told the tool, um, exactly what you did to produce that graph, then they might be able to actually help figure out why it, it was wrong. Sometimes it's really hard to tell just looking at the actual graph uh, what you might have done. Um, so that's the graphing tool. The other thing to watch with transformations is if you're told uh, the transformations, um, so let's say you're told to write an equation. Um, so let's say you have uh, an absolute value and then let's say it's shifted up six and then compressed by one half and then uh, reflected um, about the x-axis. So you have to do those in the order that they're stated. So the up six, I would add in a six outside of the absolute value. The compression, then what you have to watch out for is vertical changes always apply to the entire previous step. So because the shift was done first and then the compression, that compression is going to have to apply 
to the shift also. So I'm multiplying the entire previous step by one half and that changes. It's not just putting one and a half out front of the absolute value, but it also changes the up six to up three. So it's compressing. And then the reflection about the X axis. So that's the vertical or the horizontal axis, but that's a vertical reflection. Again, that's going to apply to the entire previous step. So it is going to change that shift up six that became a shift up three now becomes a shift down three, all because of the order. So it went up six. But then we compressed everything and flattened it down towards the x axis. So everything went half. So we have a flatter graph, but it also is closer to the x axis. And then that got reflected over the x axis. If you wanted to graph, uh, so if you wanted the equation for this graph that has its one half compressed and it's flipped, but it actually has a shift up six, then you would need that shift to happen after. But if you're given those steps in order and you're given the horizontal shift before a horizontal stretch or, or the vertical shift, I'm sorry, if you're given the vertical shift before a vertical stretch or compression or reflection, then that stretch compression reflection is going to change the shift as well. So just watch out for that and be aware of that. Okay, um, so that's chapter three, um, section three, three, four, and five, um, working kind of just generally with with various um, functions. Chapter five then, uh, so 3b looks at 5, 1 and 5, 2, 5, 3 and 5, 4 polynomial functions and rational functions. So, uh, Um, all right, so polynomial functions, uh, a couple things I want to watch you, you'll need to just go, uh, you know, look at all your course resources. So as you're even uh, in your course, in the modules, you have the, the learning activities page. So you want to be visiting those uh, and spending a chunk of time on those. Um, there are videos. You know, there's the, of course, the textbook, there's PowerPoints, whatever is supposed to work for you. The other thing you can do now is go back to those previous um, live lecture recordings. Um, but you want to spend some time, actually, don't try and just jump into the homework and expect to know what to do. Um, but the things that uh, are often uh, cause particular challenge with uh, with the polynomials one thing is just the way the questions are asked. When it asks you about uh, if you see anything about end behavior, or it mentions a power function uh, and something about large values of x, what it's actually asking for with those questions and there's a couple different ways to ask, but it's asking you for the leading term. That's what you need to give it is the leading term of the polynomial. Because what happens is when you have a polynomial, let's say I have you know negative three x to the eighteenth power, and then I could have sit like eighteen more, um, you know whatever else I have going on here. whatever, when I get big enough X values, nothing else matters anymore as far as looking at eventually what the graph does. All that matters is that first leading term. Now, um, MathLab doesn't really ask you what that actually tells you, but it tells you two things, uh, or, or the two pieces of it tell you. So the coefficient 
whether it's positive or negative, tells you something. And then the degree, based on whether it's odd or even, tells you things. So a positive coefficient, the right side is going to go up. Negative coefficient, the right side is going down. An odd degree, the two sides are going to be opposite. So the left side is going to do the opposite of the right side. Even degree, they're going to match. So, but when MATLAB asks you about the end behavior, it doesn't want you to try and describe that. It just wants you to give it the leading term, um, unless it very explicit, explicitly says that. Um, but it'll just say the end behavior is going to act like blank, and it just wants that leading term. Um, but then you use that yourself to help choose the correct graph um, or whatever know what the graph should look like um so that's the thing to, one thing to watch for is just knowing um that when it asks that information what it actually wants you to tell it because it's not very clear um then the other thing is just uh the concept of multiplicity don't let that big long word confuse you um you just need to learn what it means when you see that word multiplicity. Um, it has nothing to do with the actual um, location, but it's related to the x-intercepts or zeros. So one thing to know is x-intercepts and zeros. When you ask zeros, that's the exact same thing. So if you're listing the x-intercepts and then you're listing the zeros, that should be the exact same list. But those correspond also to the factors of the polynomial. But what multiplicity is, is uh, the power of the factor. So most of the time it's gonna be one. If I have a factor x plus two and x minus five and x plus 17, those are all multiplicity one. The factor is just there. If I have a negative five x out front, that also is a factor that has multiplicity one. So, Default multiplicity is one. But if one of those factors is squared, now it's multiplicity two. If it's cubed, now it's multiplicity three, et cetera. So if there is a power on that factor, that's the multiplicity corresponding to that zero. So now uh, with this, I would say I have a, a zero um, or x-intercept. Again, interchangeable terms there uh, of zero with multiplicity one, negative two with multiplicity one, positive five with multiplicity of three. So you're taking the opposite sign of what's in the factor, but the multiplicity has nothing to do with the actual number inside the parentheses or the factor. It's just whether uh, the power on that. So then I have negative 17 with multiplicity two. Um, the reason we care about multiplicity is because that decides how the graph actually behaves at that x-intercept. So I can graph, you know, I have um, zero and negative two and five and then negative 17. I have those x-intercepts. But what the multiplicity tells is does the graph actually cross the x-axis at that point or is it just touching it? So if it's a, an even multiplicity, it's just touching. Maybe from above, maybe from below. We don't know for sure. But if it's an odd multiplicity, it's going to cross. So that's what multiplicity is about. Again, it's it's not really super complicated. You just have to learn what that word means. Um, the other thing with the questions with multiplicity you have to watch for is you'll have to answer the questions in a particular order. So it'll say starting with the smallest x-intercept or the smallest zero. Uh, keep in mind that's thinking left to right. So negative 17 here would be the smallest, then negative two, then zero, then five. So again, maybe helpful. I would recommend that you sketch the graph out um, and before you try answering this question, get those things in order from left to right. And then you can, give that smallest, middle, largest, whatever uh, whatever it's asking you. Um, then uh, the other thing that gets asked that 
I'm against miss is just something you have to learn is the maximum number of turning points. But if you think about this, if you have trouble remembering, so it's one less than the degree. But if you think about a quadratic, so the square function, degree two, how many turning points are on the graph of a quadratic? You have that parabola, one turning point. Degree two, one turning point. Um, so it's always going to be one less than the degree. Uh, that's the maximum number. It doesn't mean it has to have that many. You can have a cube, could have two turning points, but it could also not have any turning points. So you don't have to have that many, but you're only going to be asked the maximum number anyway. Um, so, all right, let's look at a couple of examples uh, from module 3B homework. Sixteen, and I'm just going to kind of skim through this a little bit. Um, so again, I, I talked about the zeros and the multiplicity, but you see this larger and smaller, um, and then choosing the touches versus crosses. Touching means touch and not cross. Um, so that's not super clear. You just have to learn that that's what it means. They're all technically, you could say they're all touching. Uh, but as a matter of touching, not cross. And then here it says type the power function. The graph resembles the large values of X. That's where it's asking. It wants the leading term. And then um, notice here we have this negative five out front. There's not a zero or an X intercept associated with that. So that would be just a constant factor. If we set negative five equal to zero, there, there's nothing. Um, but if it was negative five X or negative if there was any multiple of x outside of there, that would be a factor that would have a zero, zero associated with it, an x-intercept associated with it. Um, and then you also have to watch um, that that's going to affect when you're finding the y-intercept, um, that that would make the whole thing go, become zero. Um, and then just for the other way that the end behavior gets asked here, it says determine the end behavior. But then what it actually asks is the graph behaves like blank for large values of x. And again, that's where you just be putting in the leading term. But then you have, again, all these different questions about the intercepts and the, the multiplicity of the zeros. But again, the x-intercepts and the zeros should be the exact same list. And then answering the question about the multiplicity in order from left to right. So the negative eight being the lesser zero and the positive one being the, the greater zero there, and then choosing the graph. Um, so that's what you have from section five, one and five, two. Five, three and five, four are rational functions. So um, just get some blank space here. Um, so the most important things with rational functions is, um, the intercepts and asymptotes. You're gonna be asked a, a whole bunch of stuff. You're gonna have these questions that have like 14 parts to them. And unfortunately the way the homework set up still just one point for that whole thing. So I would recommend make sure you're solid on coming up with the correct intercepts and asymptotes. Some of those other pieces, definitely like if you get some little piece wrong towards the end, it's probably not worth redoing the whole question for. You can look back, hopefully you can look back and figure out what you did wrong um, or why it was wrong, um, but use your time wisely so you aren't um, doing that over and over again. It's very challenging to get some of those completely correct, um, and that doesn't mean that you don't know what you're doing. It's just um, there's a lot of little pieces, but the other thing is just, uh, well, one thing, be aware that you're going to have these questions that have a whole bunch of parts to them, so plan your time accordingly. Uh, and then, yeah, when you when you get to those questions, um, try not to let that stress you out. If you are, know to watch them, get them, and then just take it one piece at a time. Uh, and I'll look at an example. I'll kind of be rushed through it, but um, kind of show you what each of those pieces. But intercepts, y-intercept is always plug in zero for x. X-intercepts, that's going to be the top. Um, so the zeros 
of the numerator. Then we have the zeros of the denominator are going to correspond to vertical asymptotes. Now, that is assuming they don't match. If we have something that's a zero of both the numerator and denominator, what that is going to do, it's going to be excluded from the domain. It is not going to be an x-intercept. It is not going to be a vertical asymptote. It is going to be a hole. So will affect uh, when you're looking, when you have the question towards the end about uh, where f of x is greater than zero and less than zero, that hole is still, is still gonna be a dividing point for that. So it's pretty much gonna affect the domain. And then that's, that's pretty much all. Um, so if that comes up where you have a function that needs to be simplified, then we have the horizontal or oblique asymptotes. So what the first thing to know is you can have one horizontal or one oblique or neither. You're never gonna have more than one horizontal. You're never gonna have more than one oblique. You're never gonna have both. Um, the rule for this, so you're going to take the leading term of the numerator divided by the leading term of the denominator. That's going to produce something that fits one of these four categories. It might be a multiple of some power of x, two or more. If it's you know multiple of x squared, x cubed, anything like that, then it's going to have no horizontal asymptote, no oblique asymptote. It's going to have end behavior that resembles that polynomial type end behavior uh, where it's going up or down on both sides, but it's getting steeper and steeper as it goes. The next option is you could just have a multiple of x. That's where you're going to have an oblique asymptote. It's going to be y equals that multiple of x, but then you have potentially plus something else. To find that the rest of that oblique asymptote, you're going to have to do long division. But you only have to do, you don't have to worry about finding the remainder, you just have to do enough to get um, that second piece of the quotient. Um, then the easiest one, I think, is when it just equals a number. You just say y equals that number. What kind of line is that? It's a horizontal line, so that's a horizontal asymptote. And then if you get a multiple of some power of x, any power of x left on the denominator, this one, you kind of just have to remember that it's going to be y equals zero. Or if you think about taking some amount and dividing it into infinitely many pieces, how big are those pieces? They're getting super tiny. They're basically going to zero. Um, so those are the possibilities for horizontal or oblique asymptotes. That's the most important stuff to, again, to be solid on, to be able to do for um, 5, 3, and 5, 4 for the rational functions. But you'll see the homework will ask you a lot of other pieces and details. Uh, so I'm going to look at one of these. Again, I'm going to kind of skip through it pretty quickly. Um, you'll have, again, if you go back to those Zoom recordings from Module 3 um, from, the, from the live lectures from the previous eight weeks, you will find more detailed uh, Again, uh, examples of homework problems, and it's even listed in that live lecture schedule of which homework problems are covered in those. Um, so for more reference, but I'm just going to kind of look through this question number 46 uh, just to see the format. So the first thing it's going to ask is for the factored form. You're factoring the top and the bottom. You are not doing any simplifying. So notice we have an x minus 6 on the top and the bottom here those stay for this first question. If there wasn't any factoring that could be done, it was already as factored as it could be, then you're going to choose it's already in factored form. The next thing we ask is do the domain. So that's the reason they have you not simplify it yet, because the domain is still going to be affected. So we have the x plus 8, the x minus 6 on top, the x plus 2, and the x minus 6 on the bottom. So we really have the minus eight and the six 
for the zeros uh, on the top and the minus two and the six on the bottom, but both the minus two and the six get excluded from the domain. So that's where, those are the points where the graph is undefined. Um, uh, and then the top would be basically the all three of those points. We have negative two, negative eight, and six are points where the graph is either undefined or zero. Um, but it turns out that it's at six, it's undefined, but it's not a vertical asymptote, it's a whole. So then uh, negative two is going to be a vertical asymptote, negative eight. Uh, is is an x intercept. So finish up so what those factors tell us. Um, but yeah, so we exclude both the negative two and six from the domain, then simplify. Now, if there wasn't anything to simplify, then you wouldn't write rewrite the factor form. You'd choose it's already in lowest terms. So don't lose some of those easy points just by not reading. Take the time to read what it's asking and. Um, get those those details. So then you're gonna have the x-intercept and the y-intercept. The y-intercept can be found by plugging zero into the original unfactored form, the simplified form, it'll still be the same. So the y-intercept isn't affected by those factors that canceled. Because it's saying the x-intercept and the y-intercept, you're just typing in the numbers, not ordered pairs. If it doesn't say type order pairs, don't type ordered pairs. Then um, it asks about the behavior at the x-intercept. So that's based on was any of those factors squared, basically. If there aren't any squared factors, then it's going to cross. If there's a squared factor at that point, it's going to touch but not cross. Then you have the vertical asymptotes. You gotta have the x equals. So it says type an equation. If you just type the number, it's going to count wrong. You've got to have the x equals. It's the equation of a vertical line and just the negative two. So again, the six, the x minus six is now gone. That's There's not a vertical asymptote there. There's just a hole in the graph. It asks about the behavior for the vertical asymptote. So again, was the factor squared or not? If it's not squared, it's going to have that opposite type of behavior where it's up on one side, down on the other. If it's squared, it'll be the same on both sides. So you have the approaching infinity on one side and negative infinity on the other for not squared. If you do have a squared factor, it would approach either po positive infinity on both sides or negative infinity on both sides. So this type of answer. Again, um, so the things that, that you wanna definitely be good with the domain, the intercepts. You should be able to get the location of the vertical asymptote, the the behavior at the intercept, the behavior of the asymptote. Those are maybe something you should be able to figure out, but not quite as uh, found like super important. Um, so then you have the horizontal or oblique. It asks them separately. Does it have a horizontal asymptote? What's the horizontal asymptote? Does it have an oblique? But once you say it has a horizontal, and in this case, we have leading term over leading term. So you're going back to the unfactored form or to the simplified form. You have the x squared over x squared simplifies to one. Take a y equals in front of that. It's a horizontal line, horizontal asymptote. As soon as you have a horizontal asymptote, you don't have an oblique asymptote. So you don't have to figure those out separately. It's really one question. But then it asks about points of intersection. If you don't want to worry about that, you want to just choose there is no point at which the graph intersects the horizontal or oblique asymptote. Um, or there is no, if there wasn't e either, then choose that. Um, you're pretty much never going to have the infinitely many points. I don't think I've ever seen one that was that. So you should definitely not choose that. But the way to figure it out is you would set the whole function and I would do the simplified form. So the x plus eight over x plus two, set that equal to the horizontal asymptote equation or oblique, whichever equation you had for the horizontal or oblique asymptote, you set the function equal to that and then you solve. So in this case, we would get x plus eight equals x plus two, but the x is cancel and we get eight equals two. Well, that's never true. So we have no intersection. 
Often though, uh, often when you have more than one vertical asymptote, then there will be an intersection with the horizontal or oblique asymptote uh, somewhere in between those vertical asymptotes. So it, it does happen. It's not like super rare for that to happen. So I think it's worth doing that process. Um, if there was an intersect, then you would get the X value and then the Y value, like in this case, the Y value would just be that one, uh, or you plug the X value into either the asymptote equation or the function equation, uh, because this is asking for an ordered pair, if there is one. All right, then you have the above and the below the X axis. So for these, you're going to go back to the unsimplified form, the factored form unsimplified, and you're going to take all of the, the zeros of all of those factors. So the negative eight, negative two, and six. Put them in order. Think of your x-axis. You're marking those on the x-axis. And that is splitting the x-axis into pieces. So here are my intervals, negative infinity to negative eight, negative eight to negative two, negative two to six, six to infinity. Those four intervals need to get sorted into the above and the below. Um, if that factor only shows up once somewhere, then it's going to change. It's going to be opposite on each side of that. So the negative eight, that was an x-intercept. It crossed. So it's going to be either positive on one side and negative on the other, one way or the other. Negative two, that was a vertical asymptote, but again, that factor was not squared. So it's going to be up on one side, down on the other. It's going to switch. But at six, it's a hole. So wherever that graph is, it's just a hole. It's going to be the same on both sides. So there, um, it's going to be you know above on both sides or below on both sides. With those shortcuts, you only need to test. It says test um, choosing a number in each interval and evaluating really, you really only need one interval. Um, and we have that Y, uh, also that horizontal, um, so that you can use either the, like the horizontal asymptote if there's one or the location of the Y intercept, you'll often already have a piece somewhere um, of what the graph is doing. So we have uh, the Y intercept was positive. So we know at zero that it's positive, we know as we get big enough values of X, it's basically going to positive one. Um, so we have positive, so above the X axis um, for the six to infinity, and then it's gonna still be the same on the other side of the hole. Uh, and then it's gonna switch to be below and then above again. Um, but the, when I see uh, even students that get this in general, what often happens is they end up combining and missing the hole and just giving the negative two to infinity where there's a hole. So if there is a hole, you need just to watch for that. Um, but again, this is this is probably like your lowest priority is this question. Uh, I would recommend as far as like what you really need to know. There's going to be a whole section in the next module that looks at solving these inequalities. So this type of work, like if you get this down, now, it, it'll make that section 5-5, five, five, uh, I think it is. Um, that should be pretty easy for you then because you've already been doing it. Um, but then, of course, choosing the correct graph is the last thing you would do. And you should be able to, um, you know, using the, lo the locations of the intercepts and the asymptotes pretty much should be enough to narrow down to the correct graph. So... Um, but you'll have so, several questions that have all of these pieces to them. So again, uh, try be prepared mentally that you're going to see that, um, that they're going to have all these pieces um, and you know, having some idea of what those pieces are going to be and what they're looking for should help. Um, so, okay, um, that is what I had for today. So, and we're done with time, but any questions from any of you? Um, and then uh, let me just do a quick, uh, in fact, I'll probably, I'll, I'll stop the recording here, but I just want to get, uh, bring up the, or post the links to the feedback form. So 
here's the link. in the chat. Uh, it's also, of course, available here. Uh, if you're watching the recording, uh, you can just uh, take that link, type it in, and do that. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm not seeing any questions, about, but I am going to stop the recording. And if there's anything uh, any of you that are, are here in person uh, wants to ask that you just don't want on the recording, uh, I'll stick around for a little bit for that. <laughs>